probably spent about seven hours with him, I suppose, in total. Because it was, we had breakfast, played around the golf, did a shoot, and had a spot of lunch. But um, he was, God, I felt like I'm going to get myself in trouble for saying it. James, how are you, sir? Hello, how good to, good to meet you, Chris. Yes, absolutely <laughs> wonderful, mate. Thank you so much for coming on the the Bought the T-shirt podcast. Um, what can I say? I'm 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 a little bit blown away with your not just your talent, but also your portfolio. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Never get bored of hearing people say nice things about you. <laughs> Yes, well, I also need to thank you for getting back to me because um, for our friends at home, originally I I contacted James because I was trying to get in touch with Mikey Carroll, <laughs> who people will remember was the lottery millionaire. And um, it's stories like Mikey's I would just I would just love to chat to him about. And uh, as a result of that, you got back to me and... When I re when I flicked to your website, it was like, oh my god, <laughs> this guy is not just an absolutely outstanding photographer, but you've also met um, some incredibly, I don't like to use the word famous, but yeah, let's just use it, incredibly famous um, faces, James. Yeah, I, I don't know how I got here, really. <laughs> but um, it's funny you say Mikey Carroll, because um, I've forgotten all about that shoot. And then the guy I did the shoot with, is a, he's now a quite a well-known writer in Los Angeles, a guy called Jeff Nash, and another friend, Jamie Fullerton. We, we all went up to do that shoot for Loaded magazine. I don't know if you remember that magazine. Was yeah, I think, I, think I've been in, magazine. I, think, I think I've been in Loaded. Oh, were you? Oh, okay, yeah. so you're, you're aware of it. It was a bit of a thing, wasn't it, for a long time? But we spent two days with Mikey Carroll up on the fence, and he's he's a <laughs> can I put it? he's mental, and it's just like somebody gave this young lad was it four and a half million quid or something, and he just went and bought a massive house with a massive bit of land and start banger racing in the back garden, motorbikes in his kitchen, just seven day long booze and drug parties <laughs> like the neighbour from hell. You know, but yeah, God, I forgot all about it. And then you emailed me about it. And then I, I think you emailed me through my, I, I didn't get a chance to get back to it. But um, yeah, I don't know where he is now. I think, he's, I think he's a bin man now. I think he lost all his money and he's working on the bins. Yes. So, I remember somebody saying back in the day, Mikey, I think when he lost all his money, someone said, Mikey's never happier sat in the front of the bin van with his can of Stella, you know, going about the going about the bin, bin round. And um, the, the thing that, the thing that gets me or in intrigues me or engages me, I should say, is like, you know, this guy, like many people, bought a lottery ticket just by sheer happenstance and the beat the odds to win not just one million, but I think it was several million, wasn't it? Mm, it was. It's a lot of money. And he just went a bit wild and, you know... It's, I'm always kind of like, I'm a little bit like I like to stand up for the anti-hero. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when society goes, oh, he's doing this and he's doing that. It's like, well, we, we, 
so what? What do you expect? What? What? You know, he's not. He hasn't put himself forward as the UN UN ambassador or something. <laughs> he's just a young lad. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he he was nice to us. I mean, I, this is the funny thing about some of the people I shoot that people have these quite strong opinions about them, and they think, "Oh, what was that person like?" And you have to be honest and say, "It's nice. It's, it's all right." I mean, I, I don't think I want to become best buddies with him, but Mikey Cat, he looked after us. He bought us dinner, you know, bought some beers. You say he was pleasant, polite, and everything else, but you know, well, clearly the guy wouldn't make the best neighbour in the country. But um, yeah, it's funny, funny that. No, you, you wouldn't want always... him. You wouldn't want him servicing your BMW, would you? <laughs> <laughs> You'd get it's it funny back. I remember he had a GSXR 750, I think it was sat in his kitchen and he didn't start it up because he'd already ruined his kitchen floor he'd been doing the, um, burnouts in his kitchen on his GSXR and you think oh god almighty some bad decision making going on here I'm just looking for your photo of him is it is it in your um, portraits oh I think um well, I didn't send you one. Do you want me to send you one now? Also? No, I'm just, I just, I'm, I'm going to try and get it up on your website. If you can point me to which. If you go to my website, if you go to, um, I do it myself actually. I'm here now. I'm, I'm. Is that Brandon? Brandon. Brandon Block. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's great as well. We're always smashing um, bottles over his head for that photo shoot. If you go to my website, you go to archive on the top, the bottom left-hand corner. Okay. I'm going to bring um, our, our viewers in so they know what we're talking about here. And if Brandon, to... Brandon, if you're watching this, hello, brother. <laughs> I love Brandon Block. That's yeah, like, so everybody loves Brandon Block, and they should do because he's just such a bloody nice guy. He is, yeah. The world needs... Oh. And he's also giving out a lot to to you know, the community at the moment, he does a lot of um, live coaching and he puts his, you know, his uh, experiences to good use. So we were going to archive, wasn't it? Yeah, and if you go to, if you go to um, all galleries. All galleries. And then you have a search box on the top. If you just search for Michael, it should bring in, bring up some images of him. Um, you yeah, around him. the block of you're making me. Um, you're making me spell stuff like live on uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's have a look. We've got a Michael. It should bring up. It bring up some actors called Michael. Yeah, is it the? Shannon. Has he got the skull in front of him? Is it that? Yeah, one? that's in his. Um, that was in his hallway. I was landing. Oh, here we go. There's him with the GSXR and his with. The... Yes, there's our boy. <laughs> Mikey, Mikey, if you ever get to watch this or if somebody knows Mikey that can put us in touch, I would absolutely dearly love to um host you on the podcast, Mikey, unless you unless you're fed up with <laughs> fed up with all of this celebrity kind of stuff. But um yes, I but I'm just a guy that you can't help feeling a soft spot for if you've ever been um you know, if you've ever kind of, what can I say, lived, side on, lived life on the other side of the fence. It's hard to know where you, I don't know how old he was. He was probably about 19, wasn't he, when he won that money. And you think he was just a lad from the fence, you know, working past that. And someone just thrust a few million quid in his pocket. I mean, what would you do, really? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Say, and, and um, you know, he did what, what so many thousands if not hundreds of thousands of Britons do every week, which is buy a lottery ticket. And then when he won, yeah, the very said people that bought, you know, bought said lottery ticket, they just turn around and rip the guy to bits. Um, I'm not saying his behaviour probably didn't, um, you know, have a have a, a a thing there, but like, oh my god, who cares about some guy at the other end of the country that races cars in his garden <laughs> on a Saturday night and and um, a lot of people would be like, "Wow, I wish I wish I, <laughs> I wish I could afford to do that." Well, you know what though, man? You think of all these pop stars that make these millions, but they have managers and agents and minders and everything to sort of keep them on the straight and narrow. He had no one. He just had a big bank balance, and then all of a sudden, he could live like a rock star. 
Yes. But I don't to tell him to stop or when to stop or how to stop or... Yeah. Right, let's just get back to us because um, I wanted to start off on a bit of a... Um, I don't want to say controversial subject. It's not controversial. It's just a very hidden subject. And I had the same chat with Robbie Williams when he was on the podcast. And if I can just pick a photo... Dun, dun, dun. Oh, here we go. Ah, hang on. There we go. Samuel L. Jackson, no more, no less, is it? It is, yeah. And um, if I've got this right, we're going to throw off a lot of our um, audience now, but, but I think a lot of people know what I'm getting at. This is the... Oh, hang on. Let's get the picture up for everyone. Um, there we go. Now... Let's just put our cards on the table, friends at home. Yes, this could just be an innocent photo. We 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 get that, but what we see a lot with celebrities in their photographs is them doing the Masonic symbolism, so the the all-seeing eye. You know, the the I don't even know what this one is. Whether it's meant to be the pyramid or 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 this kind of thing, um, and just. I was looking at this website here earlier that explains occultic symbols. And this V sign, apparently there's an awful lot more to it. Um, it goes down to the Masonic, nor, lo, the Masonic and Gnostic law of opposites, um, similar to the, the black and white checkerboard that's in the Masonic lodges. Um, this is the doctrine of bringing order out of chaos, reconciling the two opposites, evil and good. The V sign is also a sign of the horned god of witchcraft, often called Pan or Baphomet, the androgynous goat god. Sorry, James, I've gone <laughs> okay. slightly uh, off on one there to explain it, but... For those people who, who do have their eyes open, this symbology, you you, you can't miss it. Um, in fact, if you just type into a search engine, celebrities, Illuminati symbology, you get thousands of pictures exactly like this. And either we're led to believe that celebrities, um, the only thing that they do in their day is walk around covering up one eye or... or, or <laughs> It, you know, or, or shoving their um, hand inside their, you know, inside their jack, just, just randomly, which is, I can honestly say in 51 years on the planet, I've never felt the need to put my hand inside my my jacket. <laughs> for, for people listening, wonder what the hell this guy's going on about. I'm, I'm talking about the Masonic symbolism. It's a Masonic sign. It, it all, um, it, it's all esoteric language that the person in the street just wouldn't get or wouldn't uh, wouldn't understand there's obviously a whole load more of it but what i wanted to ask you james is what the hell is going on and as a photographer at what point are you told or is it suggested or you know where does it come about that right james we want you photos you know, photographing Gaga next week, and we want this, and we want this, um, we want a, you know, a checkerboard in the background, we want, you know, or, or we want some devil's horns, what, C can you shed any light on it, mate, whatsoever? I mean, if I'm very honest, that, that Samuel Jackson shoot, it came as a bit of a surprise to me, because I shot him at, um, it was a golf course, Wentworth, quite a famous golf club in Surrey, and it was a because he wanted to play around the golf before the shoot so we ended up shooting him in the clubhouse and we were stuck in this tiny little room probably not much bigger than the room I'm in now which is really hard to shoot in because you can't play with lights or anything so we struggled I thought I'm going to do and he just started doing these things with his hands and I thought that's quite cool I didn't ask him to he just started doing it but then it's interesting you, and I didn't think anything of it I just thought oh he's just he's given me something you know rather than just sit there and stare at me 
which would have been hard work. He's, he's tried, he's just kind of given me some poses and he's made it interesting. But I, a few years later, I did a shoot with Alex Jones, you know, the um, Texan talk show host. Yes, um, very we much. Spent, we spent a day with him in Austin and he mentioned it to me about that symbol with, because he'd obviously checked me out before we went over there to do the shoot. And he started talking about it. And I thought, I don't know what he's on about. I mean, I've been listening to Alex Jones a bit fun. You know, he's an interesting guy, isn't he? I think before he got big, he was like, a, I just found him on some podcast channel somewhere. You know, and it was, for me, it was interesting. It was a crazy American streaming about the government. But um, yeah, and then he started pointing out, oh, if you look at Lady Gaga, it's exactly the same. If you look at all these other, because Gaga's famous for it, isn't she? All these kind of hand symbols and... Yeah, it's an interesting, I don't know. I mean, it's, who knows? It makes great pictures. That's something you have to consider. <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> the okay side. But there's all this, because you can, but then if you're a photographer, you, you've got a choice. You think, well, you can do this, and it doesn't mean much. It, it's hard, you know. Yep. As soon as you start bringing the hands into the face, it, it suddenly becomes an interesting portrait, and it's... Hands and faces are the two big sort of... There's a language fine. here going on that most of the public misses. We've got our dear uh, Prince Harry, who apparently wants the whole world to know, or, or all his Freemasonic buddies to know that he's a Mason, because he just is always shoving his hand, um, yeah. you know, in his jacket. It's It goes as high as the Vatican, doesn't it? it it's It's just all pervasive. There's the this one. <laughs> this, um, it's it's just an incredible life that this stuff goes on, and that the vast majority of people will will just never see it. James, do you oh know god, what I mean? yeah. I mean, the, the level we all live at compared to the level the I've, I've done a few shoots with Prince Harry, been around him a little bit um, because some of the events I've been to, and then the machine. Yeah, that one. <laughs> well, it's again, it looks a little bit like a sort of goat or something, isn't it? A kind of, you know, that kind of, what's yeah. the place that, you know, yeah, there's a machine around these people. It's hard to um, fathom, to be honest. When you step into it, you step out of it, think you know it, but you don't, you don't know what's going on. But Yes, I've, I've done my digging. I'm, well, I've, I think um, since certain events that happened 20 years ago, I think every, I'm, I'm not going to say the, 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 the key words he, here, James, because we get, we get in trouble, but certain events that, that, that kind of woke the world up 20 years or certainly woke, woke a lot of us up to the fact that the reality we'd been born into and had been indoctrinated into us wasn't the reality of, of the world. And mm. so, and so for 20 years, I've, had a vested interest in this i believe in truth love light empathy um i believe human beings are essentially good and what i what i've sort of god look at it i'm sorry i'm just you can't see this james but i'm just flicking through the internet here and you know bill clinton was a big one wasn't he, he was always talking about the light the light for friends at home, as in the light bringers, the Illuminati, the light will shine on a new day and all this kind of stuff. Angela Merkel there. I mean, has she ever done a press conference where she's not, not, not doing. Well, you know, Tony Blair does that, does that a fair amount too, doesn't he? Yeah. And then you've got Jay-Z. He's calling his, is he calling his albums after like the levels of masonry and all this kind of stuff? Does he? Yes. Um, Yes, they're all at it. Anyway, <laughs> what I was going to say is, let's get back to us. Um, yeah, after 20 years of study, all I can see is that when in, we, there's many talented people in the world, right? You, you, you've met a lot of them, right? Mm. But there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that are talented enough to sign a record deal tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I know them. One of my best friends, Jess, is incredibly talented. She's just as good as, you know, I don't even know the names, guys, because I don't watch mainstream stuff, but I don't know if it's it Rita Ora or, 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 you know, my friend could get a record deal tomorrow, right? So you've got all these people 
desperate to get signed up in the music business or the film industry, but there's like a, a ceiling. And people that have talent tend to be talented, also tend to have quite a lot of uh, childhood trauma and emotional baggage and a desperate need to uh, be loved, right? To be acknowledged. And, I, and I'll hold my hand up and say, that's, that's why I started writing. It's like, I wanted my fucking five minutes of fame, you know? I didn't want to be a nobody. I didn't want to be just looked at as a, you know, someone that had battled addiction or, and all the horrible words that society use about people like myself. Um, and so you've got this ceiling where the talent is abundant on the planet, but they, they get to this glass ceiling and then the, the guys above it. So your, your, you know, your producers, directors, record company executives, all this kind of thing can then cherry pick from these hundreds of thousands of people. And they look at them and they say, right, which one of these is going to sign the pact, the Faustian pact, as in, you sign up with, with Lucifer, we are going to make you rich, right? You are going to, you know, you're going to have everything. You're going to have the three swimming pools, the 12 Mercedes, the big house. You're going to be on every, you know, you're going to be doing the Super Bowl halftime event. You're going to be doing the Brit Awards. You're going to be doing, and and you see it. You just see how it happens, right? But along with Wait, that. By the way, didn't, didn't Billy Idol do the Super Bowl halftime event at the weekend? I mean, how did that happen? I <laughs> think from from what's come across my screen again, like I'm never going to watch that. I it it's always a satanic ritual. It just is. Um, I was a fan of it. It's back in Generation X days and some of his early solo stuff. And I thought, bloody hell, he must be retired and sitting in a you know a hammock with his margarita by now, just watching the. Uh... Well, part of the the Faustian pact is is they they give you a taste of celebrity and all the riches and the adoration and the screaming fans then they put you back down again so they put you in a state of wanting massive longing to get that fame back and then when they bring you back up they say right sign here and of course most people go oh gonna get my career back yep mm. and and there's all kinds of other deep dark stuff attached to it such as um allegedly sacrifice you have to sacrifice somebody you love when you look at the amount of celebrities that have lost a loved one it's this plausible <laughs> you know it's like this 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 seems a bit plausible um and the other thing you have to be public you humiliated every now and again so you'll see a celebrity just going off the rails and you think oh they're just bloody celebrities are all you know taking drugs or whatever but no and, and apparently it's part of this pact is is this is what you you know this is what you have to do so probably gone on a bit there james apologies but but like i'm never going to get the chance to ask a professional photographer like is there any pressure put put on you no to... i mean to be honest with you most of those most of the, the shoots that i've done i've had complete creative freedom with unless there's an agent sat there who often says no you can't do that you can't do this but it's usually what you can't do not telling you what to do if you see what i mean um and often you know in terms of locations i mean one of the mags i used to work for a lot was an uncle q magazine again it died this year which is a real shame because it's such a brilliant magazine um the magazines are dying off but uh they used to pick locations. That that would be a thing. They'd have a, a picture editor or an art director. But you know, I don't know, I can't think there's ever any agenda involved. It was just right. Let's do a, let's do a shoot with a chippy sort of thing. Because um, there's, there's a shot you're talking about checker. There's a, um, it's a, chippy, a, fa a famous chippy in London on Old, Old Street. I think it is. I don't think where it is now. And it's got a big black and white check floor. I was thinking about this when we were talking about this. Other earlier and I was thinking cranky there's a check floor or something that I should have noticed it was a band called Little Dragon um but a Swedish sort of electronic band but most mostly I get to choose what goes on I, I often get told the location but when they get to the location I'm in charge I would say but but then like you say the, the Samuel Jackson shoot the guy just started putting his hands over his face you know there's not much you can 
it was good as a photographer. You're like, well, this is brilliant. I'm getting something out of this. But I've seen pictures of Ian Brown do something similar. I and mean, Ian Brown's one of the most, I don't know if you know much about him. Well, He's fascinating. I, I I'd want to shoot him again. But... I wanted to talk to you about him because he's an absolute legend. Um, let James, let's not talk about the current situation. I think everybody knows what we're talking about. I think everyone's aware that, um, you know, there are some views out there that are saying that everything's not what it seems. I think that's that's fair to say. Yeah, you can get that. ripped off YouTube for expressing those views, can't they? Yes, you know, we're it's um, it it's. As, con as a content creator, it's pretty unfair that all you're doing is 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 telling a narrative, and mm. these con these um, platforms come in and slap you with all kinds of um, punitive or restrictive measures. We could say, um, I chat to a chap the other day. He was the last man to get out of, if I say a certain building, or let's think the two buildings, he was the last man to get out alive. The three buildings. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah, and actually four if you if we include Washington, right? And oh, his, course, yeah. I, I'm not going to say his testimony because, again, we're just going to get the, the video, we'll just get banned, but, um, you know, this is a man worth listening to. And yet when I spoke to him, we just got an immediate, like, 18-year-old restriction slapped on her. It's like, what, well, 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 you know, my, my channel set at 16 years old anyway. Mm. Well, what we're saying, that 16-year-olds that, 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 that aren't allowed to know this man's experience, his truth. But, sorry, we're getting slightly sidetracked. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm very good at sidetracking myself, <laughs> James. But what I wanted to say is, yeah, um, Ian Brown... Is massively speaking out about what's going on. Yeah, his Twitter account's fascinating. At the moment. Know, he has to suffer the wrath of thousands upon thousands of very unenlightened people every day that are attacking him when all he's trying to do is save our freaking children, you know? To well, save. Do you know what's fascinating about that is that everybody wants him to just toe the line. I, I, I want my rock stars to be controversial. I want my rock stars to be able to say stuff like that and not not just become these, you know, machines of the, of the sort of the industry. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I want people to have controversial views. That's, that's what how rock, call him rock, indie, whatever you want to say he is. But, you know, it's good for him for having an opinion that's not popular. Good yeah, exactly. And the other chap... Um... Lead singer of the Verve, Ashcroft. Yeah, Richard Ashcroft. He's now independent, isn't he? I believe, and he's come out with some tracks in which he talks about them and they, a little bit like um, uh, reflecting back to Michael Jackson when he used to say, you know, all about them in 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 his songs and. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just refreshing. And then you you get the absolute Muppet puppets like Lady Gaga that will just tow, and Madonna that just tow this satanic line just to keep, just to keep themselves, yeah, it's, you well, know. Wasn't Lady Gaga an envoy to the UN last year? Oh, they all get these. <laughs> which is, which they, is fascinating to me. They but. get they get these puppet positions in which they have to spin the narrative. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, not talking to anyone like specific here, but, um, you know, you've got, yeah, you've got to support the UN. You've got to support the world health organization narrative. And, mm -hmm. and if you do that, you will remain in the public eye. It's, 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 um, like, I kind of get it, but it, 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 it's like this, James. If I lost my career tomorrow, all my YouTube and then my writing would suffer and I'd go back to, you know, probably having to have it. Like, I could look myself in the mirror and say, Chris, you're a fucking legend, you know. 
you are a genuine hero in society. I'm not bigging myself up here, James. It's just I've got a son. He needs to know that his daddy is is a, a you know, a real hero. I was going to say real man. I don't want to upset people, but like a, he's a warrior. He's a fighter. He does what's right. He's not afraid. He's not going to go out in public and be told how he's you know got to got to behave under under false under a you know completely false narrative and and these celebrities they're the other way they're cowards they will just keep you know keep spinning these lies and supporting the these these lying narratives just so they get their five minutes of fame on stage what you know three times a year or whatever it is and appear in this magazine or that and and Ah, who am I to judge other people, mate? But I'm just saying, if you, anyone listen to this, it's the Ian Browns of the world. Unless you're going to tell, unless you you're going to tell me, <laughs> unless you're going to tell me something different that that have woken up. And that, uh, the, the only thing I, I I did a shoot with Ian Brown. I'm, not, I, I'm a massive fan. The only thing I did was quite funny, and it's funny. It's not anything sinister. He knows in one of the Harry Potter films, wasn't he? He had a very brief cameo. And we recreated that shot. If you if you know Harry Potter, which is, I've seen like our kids, I've seen the films. He's sort of stirring a cup of tea, using his finger as a wand to move the spoon. Re reading a copy of um, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time and Space. So we recreated that in a little cafe in Chiswick. He was brilliant. He's, he's a lovely guy. Yes. If anybody anybody listening knows Ian, could you please put us in touch because. I, he's a hero of mine, you know, for what he's saying on Twitter at the moment. He's just, you know, it takes a brave, enlightened person to just stand out from the crowd and do what's right. Um, yeah, we. We'll, I'm, I'm just looking for his pic picture here. Where would I find? Oh, I could have, is, it, is it not in here? I can't remember what I sent you. Oh, here, we go. here we go. I've got him. Here we go, folks. Look. Chris and technology, I am your man. <laughs> there we go. What a legend. Um, yeah, he's a. Uh, it's, it's, that's the great thing about my job sometimes. I get to meet people like Ian Bryant, who I've listened to his music since I was, uh, you know, 18 years old. And then you kind of hang out with him and have coffees for two or three hours. It's such a yes. treat, really. Well, you've. You've had the experience that I've had, but you've had it even more so, and that's that that I started the podcast, Jane, just so I could speak to incredible people, you know, people that have, have sort of done stuff with their lives, and, um, you, you know, you even more so. <laughs> it, oh, I don't know, but it's, um, it's funny, I don't know how you, cause I, I, you, you were in the army for a while, weren't you? So you probably travelled the world, I imagine, with that, and then continued that adventure but it's only I, I started off wanting to be a war photographer that was my um that's what got me into into photography when I was 18 and I thought oh, you know what I used to watch used, used to read the independent when it was a good newspaper I mean it's it's trash now but it, believe it or not it used to be a really really good newspaper and it was independent and I used to see some of the photography from people like David Ashdown and, and all and, you know, I used to think oh, I, I want to do that but it never happened, but I ended up getting steered towards sports more than anything else, being quite a sort of sporty person. And, um, but yeah, it's funny how your life takes these sort of meandering turns, doesn't it? You know, you've got to keep it sort of going in one direction, but you end up where you end up with a load of kind of weird little turns in your, in your back rear view mirror. It's funny yes. you get to where you go. It is interesting. Um, I... I Sorry, I wanted to continue down that thread, but I do need to ask you, have you ever seen the documentary? Um, it, it's called something like Which Way to the Front Line? Mm, I don't think so. Oh, it was... Um, again, I'm just going to do a quick search. Um, it was about these war journalists. Uh, one in particular... Sorry, folks, if you're hearing me loud typing. <laughs> I don't... Now, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Which way to the front line? What an incredible documentary. 
It was re recommended to me by a, a former Royal Marines friend of mine, um, good friend of mine, Matty. Um, that's Matty Elliott for, for the people that are aware. He's done a lot of my um, shoots on my, my adventures. Um, and it's the story of Tim Heverington. Oh, um, right, yeah. He spent time, I think it was in Restrepo, which was a, 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 yeah. an outpost in Afghanistan. Um, he he spent time there with Sebastian Junger, again, another famous, very famous journalist and writer who wrote the book, The Perfect Storm, plus plus a lot of other stuff. And yeah, it was just about, um, let's see if I can get a picture up here. Because Tim was shot, wasn't he? If I remember rightly. Yes, there there he is. So I'm just getting the picture centred. Um, yeah, he he. Th these guys were a bit. They're kind of all crazy. These war journalists. I think they're quite famous for partying, taking lots of drugs, putting themselves in extreme danger, laughing it all off, and and I guess kind of thinking it's never going to happen to me. Yeah. And yeah. sadly, with Tim, after a. a a, an outstanding career where he photographed war in its rawness. Um, he, I think he just got shot dead one day. Yeah, I heard all these stories that he started, um, I, I hope I'm right when I say it, I'm not speaking out of school, but he became sponsored by Leica. And so he started using Leica cameras. And it meant he had to get a little bit closer because Leica didn't, didn't have the big 300mm lenses that he were, might have had access to could use Nikon or so he was always kind of pushing it a bit. And there's also, there's a weird time where I think there was a time when um, journalists and photographers were almost immune. People didn't see them as targets. I think that all changed around Afghanistan, didn't it? But, and, yes. and Iraq, where they started seeing the, the, the media as a target and they started taking out, rather than seeing a press vest and ignoring it, they'd see a press vest as a target. And it, it all flipped around that time. And lots more journalists were being shot and photographers too sadly, sadly for both journalists and photographers but yeah but if you they go back to some Vietnam also, days lots of the media were almost immune it used to be left alone yeah who was the chap that was it the son of Errol Flynn that was the famous photographer in Vietnam or, or at least one obviously there were many but um, I think he was the like a descendant of Errol F Flynn um <laughs> I'm just going to... God, I'm, I'm glad I got my search engine up today. I've, I've, I've really <laughs> needed it. Um, uh, yeah, Sean Flynn, that was the chap's name. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's this iconic picture of him. He embedded with... Um, let's have a look. He embedded with troops... Uh, I think in Vietnam, I'm showing a picture now. He's parachuting and he's taking a photo of himself. <laughs> and when I um, when I did my skydiving course, I tucked my camera in my top top pocket one time. And after I pulled my pulled my chute, I took the camera out and I I've got photos like I've got a photo a bit a bit similar similar to this. Um, I can't remember. It's in the middle Remains of Errol Flynn's son found, so I'm guessing that he came a cropper at some point. Um, Sean Leslie Flynn was an American actor and freelance photojournalist best known for his coverage of the Vietnam War. Um, the only child of Australian-American actor Errol Flynn. There we go. Wow, didn't know that. He disappeared on the 6th of April, 1970, aged 28, um, on Highway 1 in Cambodia. Wow. So he used to embed with the Special Forces units. And um, yes, it's that thing, isn't it? That, that you know, you kind of don't think it's going to happen to you, but... On the one hand, we need war journalists, or we, you know, the war needs to be sort of chronicled. Um, then there's and the also, whole. There's, there's something they say about a lot of them is that um, often people, military personnel, do tours, 
and they'll do one or two and they'll maybe find a less frontline position. But sometimes Wolf Tom have been on the front line for decades, decade after decade. They're just finding another another hotspot to get to. It's driving them mental. It must drive them mental. Yeah, it must become a massive adrenaline rush, mustn't it? Yeah. The, 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 mm. going, going back to normality for them is like a serviceman that's been in war going back to normality. It just it just doesn't quite cut the cut the mustard. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of um, readjustment to do, but let's let's go back to your outstanding images, James. Um, let's have a look at this one. Um, um, here we go. We're looking at Mr. Gervais. <laughs> Again, I like Ricky too for his outspoken ways. <laughs> is he a bit of a scamp? Is it fair to say? Um. He's hard work, not not for the wrong reasons, but probably for the right reasons. He's just um, it's like dealing with children. He's just he's just. I've shot him both times with Carl Pilkington and Stephen Merchant, and it's just I don't know. It's like herding cats, but he's brilliant, and I love him, and he's friendly, and he's he's polite. And you when you consider how big he's become, you know, he's got to be the best paid comedian. Maybe Dave was it Dave Chappelle might be higher paid, but Ricky must be out there with the most famous comedians on the planet, must not he? Um, but hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Um, we, that was shot for you know, the Idiot Abroad, Idiot Abroad um, yes. series. Well, we did the promo shots for that um, for the American audience, so it went out to the Science Channel. But um, yeah, great fun. But he's fantastic too, because he calls out lots of this stuff, doesn't he, when he's doing his Golden Globes hosting. The, the kind of yeah, he's kind of Stuff puts those cares. Americans on their, um, you know, on, on tenter hooks. Yeah. Um, There's a rumour going around he's going to do the Oscars. I mean, I think I'd, I'd, that'd probably be the best night's TV of the year if he did. But yeah. I, I think it's fair to say, though, that he's also done his fair share of the old. Um, oh, has he? <laughs> well, I. I <laughs> There's a fine line, isn't there, between coincidence. And, you know, oh, my God, it's just bloody blatant now. You, There's no, um, you know, there's no sort of, there's no sort of deny. You know, if you if you consistently in every bloody other photo you do, you're doing this stuff. It's, it's kind of like, um, what's that law? What's the law that you've got to employ? Um, oh, um, when the simplest solution is probably the right solution. Yeah, that, that. That kind of thing. I can't. Somebody, if you're listening, put it in the comments. What's that <laughs> law? Is it not not Murphy's law? The other one, isn't it? It's like if it looks like a, a chicken, it walks like a chicken, and it's like it's probably a chicken. <laughs> um, yeah, God, yeah, I know what you mean. But uh, yes, and, and 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 Ricky, no disrespect. I'm I'm just saying. Uh, let me. I'm just going to have a little. Look, what about so uh, Michael Palin? What's um, <laughs> it's, it's funny. I'm somebody asked you the other day, they said, Who's probably the nicest person you photograph? I'll have to say Michael Palin, it's just a really nice gentleman. Um, again, I mean, it's, it's I think we shot that for his Sahara series. When was that? That's 15 years ago now, wasn't it? Probably when he just kind of he had his. Brilliant gig, didn't he? You're just going on these incredible travel shows around the world. But um, yeah, what a great guy. Just uh, yeah, he certainly just, lived a life, hasn't he? Yeah, and he's sort of he's kind of how you, I think you want your TV personalities to be. You know, he doesn't doesn't seem to have an ego. Doesn't seem to have um. He's an educated guy. He just seems to be well raised, I would say. But um. Very accommodating. Yeah, so I'm going to get his. Oh, for some reason, I if I double click, it, it jumps forward two pictures. So I've got to try and remember not to do that. Yeah, there he is, our Monty Python. Because I can't see it on my end. So is it the shot? He's he... slightly leaning to one side like oh, this. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. Do you? Can you? If I say something like that, does that trigger your memory like immediately as a photographer? Yeah, yeah that was the shot. That I got. <laughs> Because, I mean, it's the same as a content provider. You've got to get the right image for your your 
videos or whatever or your thumbnails and uh, I think you it, it is a bit like a photograph in your photographic memory it's like yes that was the one no there were certain frames and I think that was um one of the more sensible ones because we had him we had him with a shirt off and we cut a bit of wood big piece of plywood and cut us off a circle a semicircle on the end so we could put his head into it so it's only his head was poking out then we surrounded him with sand build a sand <laughs> So it looked like his head was poking out the desert and superimposed it onto a, a desert background. Oh, but, sorry, um, sorry for our friends at home. I didn't... Um, there we go. Sorry, friends at home. I didn't um, put that one up on the screen. There we go. Let's, let's see who else we've got. Well, we've got low. We could, we could talk all day, couldn't we? Oh. Keith Flint, is it? Is it not? Yeah, Keith Flint. Yeah, you know how I said I was so felt so lucky to shoot Ian Brown. I would put Keith Flint in the same same category. It's a, it's, a, it's an even artist I enjoyed so much growing up. I still do to this day. You know, I still play his music, especially if I'm going for a run. You know, it's perfect, isn't it? But um, yeah, it's a shame about Keith, isn't it? Because he's clearly struggled towards the end and had all sorts of problems, but. Yeah, what a shame. But it, what I liked about him was he wasn't just a fake, he was a proper renegade, wasn't he? Like we shot him um, racing bikes at Cadwell Park and he won the race. Yeah, I saw your, um, in your wonderful magazines, I saw some of the pictures. Um, do you want to just explain, James, to our friends at home what, 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 what the magazines are about or, or it, where would they buy them if, if that's still possible? Um, well, Union is on a sort of break at the moment. A, because we can't travel to shoot another one because we can't get to the States. But Volto is my personal thing. It's just a way of me publishing this work that I felt never really got used properly. So it's got sheets with Donald Trump in there and Keith Flint and, yeah, he's just... It's unbelievable that the guy can be a massive presence in music and then win endurance races on a motorbike. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, he's a, he's a star. He really was. He um, could ride. He can really ride. I was, um, I was really surprised, James, because the last I heard, he'd taken to gardening. Oh, really? Kind of, you know, quit the, drug, the, the rock and roll and druggy lifestyle and, and he'd, he'd taken up gardening. And... I've got like massive respect when I hear things like that. I think, well, you know, <laughs> just the guys found peace and happiness. And then when I heard that, actually, no, that, you know, um, that wasn't the case. Um, yeah, quite, quite sad, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's hard to get your head around, isn't it? Because you feel like you have everything, didn't it? When you think about it from from a basic standpoint. He had incredible success, adulation, you know, he was talented, money, wealth. And it's funny, isn't it? It doesn't, it still doesn't, it's not enough, is it, for some people? It's not, it's not all about that. You know what no, I mean? I mean, I think they, um, that's the stuff that they have to get over and put behind them because it's all about ego, isn't it? When you live that, you know, you're, you're living in your ego when it's all about money, fame and, and celebrity mm. and adoration and, that's never, you know, that's just never going to end well. And I think, I think some of these um, uh, celebrities get over that and they reject it and they they walk away. If indeed they they haven't signed signed this 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 pack, because if you sign the pack, you're never allowed to walk away. Allegedly, right? I'm only. Yeah, I feel like Keith had walked away from it a little bit because you know how. Um... Well, that, quite... that, that begs the question, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to this wonderful man's memory at all, but one of the things about walking away is it ain't going to end well for you, right? You, 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 you're you, going to be one of these guys that manages to shoot themselves in the back of their head or... or, or, or I'm, friends, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial. I'm just saying this. this is the, you know, this is like the buzz. I think we said in the Marine, you know, this is the one of the theories and it 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 may well just have been he was a, a tormented man and and his demons got the better of him and 
Yeah, do you know, I think a lot of artists are tormented people because um, I haven't met a few. <laughs> they're, um, they're all, or can be a little bit unhinged, you know, because there's a certain um, drive, isn't there, to want to want fame and to want to be in front of people because it's my worst nightmare to be on stage and have people screaming at me. It's my worst nightmare to be recognised in the street. But some people, I'm not saying it's him because I don't think, that's what the prodigy were ever about. They were a punk band, essentially, in the in the electronic kind of genre. But um, but you know, I didn't see he get his hands dirty. You know, he wasn't just a bit of a a diva. He was a proper bloke that didn't mind going out and smashing his head against a tarmac at eighty miles an hour <laughs> if it went wrong that that day. Yes, yes. So I'm just um. Trying to, I'm not very good at multitasking, James, but I'm acutely, <laughs> acutely aware that there's stuff, um, um, there's stuff I wanted to 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 to, to bring up. Um, what? It, let's just ask a silly cliche question. Who was like your favourite? Who's the been the the best experience to photograph? Keith would be one of them for sure. Just because I just we just chatted all day about bikes. Now, I love I love bikes. I love passion for motorcycles since I was a teenager. But um, do you know it's funny because sometimes it's people you just bump into on random kind of story shoots. You know, you just meet nice people. They say, celebrities. but I mean, yeah, Ian Brown was great fun, very nice. Um, somebody else was shot, Lincoln Park. Do you remember the rock band? Yes. They were massive in the sort of 90s and 2000s. Sadly, Chester died, didn't he, like two years ago as well. I think he committed suicide. Quite a few of my portfolio have committed suicide, <laughs> which is quite a horrible thing to say. Um, yeah, they were great fun. Likes a bit of footy, so we could have a good chat about that. We played, we played football against them in a five-a-side. Sorry, James, was he the chap that... Committed suicide. Was it? Yeah, that's he was linked with um, exposing certain things about Hollywood as well. Just a was it Be Beddington? Is that his name? Or Beddingfield? Beddington. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not. Ever since the dance scene landed, I've never been much up on uh, on sort of other. Other um, other music. Sorry, I was just getting some folk. There's a there's a guy for anyone that's interested in this um, this symbolism stuff that we've talked about. There's there's a wonderful channel by a chap called Jeremiah Cohen. He's on YouTube, and I've tried to get him on the podcast because he's massively. Um, this is his channel, by the way, folks. If um, I think you can see it. Um, hang on. He talks about the Hollywood coven and what you've got to do to stay famous. Jeremiah Cohen, there he is. Um, it was actually him that did the video. He did a video on Ricky, Ricky Gervais. And Ricky, if you're watching, no, I'm not suggesting anything. It's just many of us have answers because we're, we're parents and this stuff is just it just gets weird and it's not stuff um it's not stuff i really you know any parent would really want in their children's lives it just gets so here we go yeah gosh it's um it's like a smorgasbord of of um oh we got we've got to go for this gentleman especially in the the current climate oh what was it like meeting President Trump? I get myself in trouble here because everybody wants me to say he was a monster. No, but, um, no, no. no. It, it, um... I, I, I just, I just give you a, a heads up, James. Um, a lot of our subscribers think the guy was a force for good. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty apolitical, and I think I'm not a fan of any political party, if I'm very honest. I'm quite old-fashioned sort of liberal in a way. I just believe in personal liberty and 
personal responsibility, <laughs> call me old fashioned. But um, anyway, but he, he hadn't, this was about a week before he, nom- he threw his hat into the ring to become the nominee for the Republican Party. So I wasn't aware of any of his political ambitions at this point. But, um, but we spent about seven hours with him, I suppose, in total. Because it was, we had breakfast, played around the golf, did a shoot, and had a spot of lunch. But um, he was, God, I felt like I'm going to get myself in trouble for saying it. He was a nice bloke to hang out with for the day. Funny, like constantly cracking jokes. Um, polite, asked me about my kids, asked me about my life, you know, asked me about where I lived, you know, and you don't always get that when you photograph people with that financial standing in fame. You know, often they just want you out of the way. They want to do the shoot, and then you're you're the photographer, they're the star. But he was um, very engaging. So when he became this sort of figure of hate so quickly after winning the American election in, was it 2016? I just thought, oh, it's not the bloke that I met. It was a funny, weird kind of change. And I had to keep explaining this when people asked me what he was like. And I thought, oh, it's awkward, because I'm not going to lie. He wasn't horrible. He was very nice. In fact, I seem to remember him being quite chatty, which is unusual when you meet people, like you say, who are that famous. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to say, hey, I think I disappoint people sometimes when I say that. But, no, we're um, yeah. here, James. We're just about the truth. It's just that simple. And, and, and we must speak our truths in life. And it, a lot of people um, would say, that he was a good man and that right from the start of his presidency and I just point out to people listening I don't vote right I'm I'm well aware that the world is controlled by an elite bunch of sociopaths that control every single political figure whether like directly by direct means or or indirect means Um, so Please don't like count me as a Trump supporter or a Biden voter. I, I just don't do any of that kind of stuff, right? I like my freedom. Politics is just a system of oppression. It keeps us all enslaved, buying into this phony notion that because we've got a red party and a blue that we that we live in democracy. It's I would say it's utter nonsense. But looking like from the outside in, it did appear that President Trump was prepared to rock the boat, that he was prepared to ask, you know, to to challenge the factors that were not making America as great as he believed it could be. And it also seemed right from the outset, um, even before he became president, when Barack Obama openly laughed at him in, in, in a public forum, it was some big, you know, big speakers convention I don't know if it was a, 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 an after dinner speech or whatever you know but he publicly humili- humiliated this man um, and President Trump came good he 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 he, he got in you know he, he got into power and from that moment it just seemed like there was a media campaign to destroy the guy right playing on all mm. people's emotions bringing race into it bringing disability you know, and when you look at his presidency, he there wasn't the, the he didn't cause the mass mutilation in the world that that his predecessors did. You know, he certainly wasn't a, a, a warmonger or a puppet for the warmongers like both Bushes were, and like Obama was with his um, allegedly um, more. There were more bombings or drone strikes under Obama than 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 I think going going back to Vietnam, right? <laughs> you know the amount of ordinance that was that were dropped on underdeveloped countries, um, and so what I'm trying to say, James, is no, please be honest about the guy because we 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 you know we need to we need to hear the the the, the alternative narrative or can we call it the, the the true narrative and personally speaking I think the world's in an incredibly dark place I think that although Donald Trump might have been a bit 
you know, possibly rough around the edges, which there's a military per person, we're not really bothered about that, you know. Um, but I think that he saw this great evil in the world and he tactfully as possible tried to uh, instigate a plan to address it and the vicious backlash that he got lead even leading up to this election which you know I, I'm just going to say kind of the result beggars belief I think shenanigans is probably the word um and yeah, I think there was such a vicious backlash against him because the powers that be, you know, all 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 related to all, all you know, all kind of interrelated to the stuff we've been talking about. They just set out to dis, you know, to destroy him and make sure that this, you know, possible force for good in the world. I say possible, you know, I, I'm never going to know the truth, am I? But to make sure that he didn't get a second term. And to install somebody um, that would just continue this this to in in implement the agenda of this what I call the sociopaths, you know, this these 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 people that just control the whole goddamn show. Um, and uh, yeah, James, sorry, I'm I'm just I just think we need we need to be saying our truths because it's 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 it kind of it guts me to think that the the children now they're not going to have the privileges that we did they're not going to be able to travel freely they're not going to have um free free choice it's all heading towards the direction of if of, of mm. you know things i think everyone knows the things that we're on about but words like you know digital passports and and uh, health passports and all this kind of stuff forced on them when essentially we're free human beings we have the right to travel you know where the hell we want under universal law and now we're being hemmed into this uh, you know this very dark um dark agenda and um and yeah we 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 need to speak out of it so i i i think you're very brave saying the truth and if you're saying he was a good guy like, I oh, I don't know. He was a good guy. I could say he was nice. To, he was nice to me. I mean, I think I don't I liked him as a president. In that, I think it was great to have an independent and break up this this um kind of left right big paradox paradigm. Sorry that we seem to have, but I just felt he was a bit of a blunt tool, wasn't he? For quite an instrument job, he said the wrong things. He he wasn't very good at his own PR. He, I'm a bit, like I say, I don't have any love for any politicians, really. I find the whole thing a bit of a, um, to choose my words carefully. A bit of a <laughs> sham. I don't have any love. I don't have, I don't have any love for him in the same way. I don't have any love for any of them, really. But um, he was pleasant on the day. And like I say, he was probably, uh, he, didn't, he, he was nice. He was just friendly. Um, this is why I'm really quite, quite tiptoe around this, because I don't want to be seen as somebody who's like a Trump supporter, because I'm not, I don't have much stock in a lot of the stuff. He's, he, the way he conducted himself was, was unfortunate. But then I could say that about any politician, really. This is why I'm quite ambivalent about it, really, because, you know, I, I, I spent a day with Tony Blair once back in about 1997. Well, um, I know. <laughs> and it's funny to, to contrast these two experiences, because... Okay, Tony Blair's got his, his detractors now, but he was the sort of the toast of London for a long time, wasn't he? But he was a horrible man to be in the company of for five or six hours. Actually, it's more than five or six hours. I think I was there from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m., um, shadowing him back in 96, maybe 97. I can't think when it was there. But um, yeah, he was considered to be a very successful prime minister by a lot of people. But, I always saw him as a bit of a nasty piece of work after spending a few hours in his company. So it's, yeah, it's a tricky one. I, I don't know. I don't know if you can judge somebody's character as well by spending a few hours in their, in their company. You know, 
because you can have a bad day, can't you? And people can think, oh, what a dick. You know, he was horrible. And you think, well, maybe that day his dog died or something. And then he had to get up and, and do a photo shoot and didn't want to do it and got told he had to do it. I don't know. It's, um, it's tricky to judge somebody on a slice of, a tiny slice of, of spending time with them. But, um, who knows? You know, Trump's a funny thing. I wonder how we'll look back on him in 10 years' time as a society. I mean, yeah. it will kind of see it all differently. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard one to see with him because people get so we emotional won't. about it. He's yeah, the bogeyman, isn't it? We won't be looking back. We've been dumbed down to such an extent. Our critical thinking skills have been removed. And will be even more controlled by these monsters. Um, and that's it, isn't it? Like, if we had the ability to look back and reflect, we, we would have looked at the Vietnam War and we would have looked at the Second World War and the First, and we'd be like, right, let, let, let's not be doing that stuff again, right? Let's, let's look at the precursors to all this. Let's look at the motivations behind them. Let's look at the amount of money and power that are garnered by certain individuals in society off the back of these conflicts, right? It's, it's, it's just nothing short of evil, right? But of course we don't, we don't look back. The next generation comes along, they're even a bit more dumbed down than the next because it's um, Donald Trump. Um, and I think there's, there's a lesson there to be learned that we, we, we shouldn't feel hesitant or embarrassed to just say our truths in life. And I'm also, James, like a slight apology to you, mate. I, I am well aware that um, I'm using this podcast as, as a kind of launch, uh, um, a, a voice, so to speak, but it's just because I'm so passionate about life. I think I'm one of the very few people on the planet that, that really see the kind of holistic picture of what, what is happening to us as a, as a human race. Um, I might be completely, completely wrong, but um, what I'm trying to say is it's, it, it's all good credit to you, mate. It's all, it's all good, good credit to you for bringing... Well, if you hadn't taken these pictures, we wouldn't be having this conversation, would we? True, true. I think the internet, I think it's a West Country thing. I think I can see the cows going past outside. They must be trampling all over the uh, the internet cables. <laughs> Where, whereabouts are you? In the, uh, well, without like you know compromising yourself, are you, are, are you sort of you know exit away or? No, I'm in Bath. Okay, all yeah, right. Yeah, so I I thought hard energy. I thought Bath was um more. I'm just looking at my map up here. Not that it really shows Bath, but it does show the UK. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have said Bath was West Country. Or oh, dare you? <laughs> yeah, I, but, but for someone who's travelled to eighty-seven countries on all seven continents, my geography is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think we consider ourselves West Country here. Yeah? Um, yeah, Gloucestershire, Somerset, kind of yeah. that, that area. Ah, okay. Bath is not my, my my girlfriend spends a lot of time but well she used to we, we we had relatives up there um everybody keeps dying so if everybody if you're watching this please just just like stop dying right <laughs> you you're ruining the narrative but um yeah she spent a lot of time up there it's a place I think I've been once in my life mm. um once I get north of Somerset I I just think I'm like you know I'm from the south like from Devon, so I think like I'm in Scotland when we go past Morton. <laughs> everyone's everyone just becomes like really friendly and and speaks with these these funny accents. <laughs> they, they all sound like the angry bootneck who I who was on my podcast the other day. Matt, much love to you, mate. No no disrespect, man. Um, come on, let let uh, let let's get into some of these pictures and 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 and. Friends at home, we're going to stop all the, you know, the alternative talk now and um, and just just have a look at these cracking images. So, oh, Mr. Vinnie Jones. Yeah, 
I like Vinny. I, I, you know, I shot him. I think when I first started shooting sports, I remember getting loads of praise from all the pitch desks. I used to shoot Premier League matches and then we'd syndicate pictures out to all the sports desks and the Sun and the Star and the Mail and the whatever, the Telegraph. And then I remember getting this lovely shot of Vinnie Jones sort of monstering Matt Letizia down at the Dell in Southampton. And, uh, yeah, he's a brilliant footballer. And I think I, I shot him a few times after that at little kind of press events. And he was, he's, he's, he wouldn't mess with him. You wouldn't mess with him, but he's nice to you if you're nice to him sort of thing. But I think the shot, I can't see what you're looking at, but I think the shot you're looking at is him with the tall paw. Is it? Yes, and unfortunately, James, he's pointing at you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> that was only shot, you know, shot, no, not, not to the end of 2019, that one, up in, up near Loch Lomond, but, um, on an ad shoot for a bike manufacturer. He's doing a, this quite a cool horror, or mini horror film. But yeah, I like him. I like him a lot, really, because I think he's a straight talker. And he um, he treats you how you treat him. I think that's quite a nice quality in life. He won't take any nonsense, but be nice to him. He's nice back. That's quite a nice yes. way to live life. And it's, you know, I've got full respect for the guy, not just because he's a legend. And, he, and let's be honest, I, I like men's men. I just, I, I just do. I just... I mean, I, lo I love everybody. That's <laughs> so I've probably probably been a bit of a hypocrite, but I I, I got a bit particular passion for men that just get out and smash it and like are not afraid to like be bloody men. Yeah. And 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 we're we're all being made to be ashamed to be men these days again. Part the agenda of the sociopaths, which we weren't going to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but you know, Vinny he came to um, acting fame in in was it lock stock and two smoking barrels hence, yeah uh, hence this ma amazing image of him and bloody good credit to the guy you know he went out to make it in hollywood and he's he's um he's got in all kinds of productions and even more credit again he started the hollywood football team which oh, was, he? um and 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 on a on a sort of slightly sadder note he's lost his his wife hasn't he yeah um I, and I didn't realize but she was sick at the time of me taking that doing that shoot it was a two-day shoot we did with him um and when you when you look back and you know that he was going through that you think oh he handled that bloody well because you know he probably could have cancelled that and walked away from it but he turned up professional you'd have a chat with him he loves talking about dogs and shooting and shotguns you know and that's what he's into you know it's just a, an interesting guy really um I'll he also forward. does right out of that so he also loves land rovers which is another thing i quite like so he's a hey you know, I, I, I like it uh, james i look forward to the day where i can just drive bloody land rovers around my ranch and shoot shit you know <laughs> <laughs> shoot dinner just like, like I'll be the podcasting equivalent of Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so Vinny, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Bit of a legend in my life for for, for, for me, and I, I, I like I like to select my legends. You know, you got to have some kind of compass bearing. Um, yeah, you have, and um, to go through the loss of a partner. Yeah. And then come out the others. Jeez, it's just, it's, ah, uh, it, 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 it's beyond belief. But at, at, at least people like Vinny show that it's possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and that life goes on, and that's it. You know, that is it. Life goes on. Um. Well, if you're into Land Rovers, a, a client of mine, I didn't send you any pics, it's more of a commercial thing, but there's this company in, um, near, near Froome in Somerset do the most amazing renovations of old classic Defenders. And just strip them down to the bolt, strip the engine down and re-spray everything, clean it. Like brand new 25-year-old Defenders, they are absolutely amazing. But they do cost a lot, so... That's the downside. Yeah, well, well, let's chat about this after the podcast because I, um, I'm, I'm, I really like documentary kind of stuff, and there's stuff we're, we're working on a documentary at the moment. We're going to um, 
track the import of cocaine into the UK from from where it lands in Spain when it when it comes up from um, I'm guess I'm you know I'm going to be honest I don't even know where it lands in Spain but I just a lot of it comes across from Morocco doesn't it yeah um, it it it, it, it does through... but but when you think Morocco you immediately think hashish you know it's going to be hashish but I'm wondering how it gets from South America to that part. But probably. Well, we tell. bumped into. I drove across the Sahara about 10 years ago, did it twice in an old crappy old car. And you meet people on the way because you stop off at all the places all the over. The overlanders are stopping, you know, the guys doing it in their army trucks and whatnot. And they've got a chance to these guys. And it did get my mind thinking about this because they were saying that there's a route. A lot of them come into not Morocco, they're coming to the country down there, sort of Mauritania or something like that. And then they. They can just buy their way up to the Spanish, to um, to the sorry, to the North Moroccan coast, and that's how they find their way into Europe. It's the easiest way to get into Europe from South America because to go straight from South America to Spain, it's a big gamble. You're going to get busted and lose everything. Whereas they can get into they can get into West Africa a lot easier, a lot, lot less risk, and then just ah, uh, of course, buy their way up. of course, straight across to West Africa. Yeah. Pay the bribes. Exactly, yeah. You've got, you've got your route. It's all, yes, of course. Of and the course. route, there's a road there now, but to get from, you used to have to go across the actual desert to get from Mauritania, but well, from, I think it's Nouakchott, which is the capital, up to the, the border with Western Sahara, you know, the sort of southern Morocco. So it used to be, there was no one there. You just crossed in the desert. There's no police there. There's nothing. There's a few tumbleweeds and a couple of, a couple of guys with towels around their heads. But, um, there's a road there now, so I reckon it must probably be easier for these guys now yeah. to get to get the product up. But yeah. So by all means, yes, yeah, speak to me about Land Rovers afterwards because that sounds that sounds like it, it can make a fascinating fascinating uh, mini documentary. I'm going to go to this this chat, James. Hang on, where are we? Look at that! One of my all-time heroes, Lou Ferringo. No more, no less. <laughs> Yeah, again, he's a funny one. We didn't think he would. We shot him for Union Magazine. You know the the, 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 old, the old project. He just let us come and visit him in Santa Monica. He just sat in his gym for about two hours and he just chatted away to us with a photo shoot. He's still massive, by the way. Huge. But, um, yeah, it's funny. He's he's a bit of an icon, maybe of our generation. I think if you chat away to somebody in their teenage years, they won't have a clue who he is anymore. No. So for, for our friends at home, Lou Ferringo was the Incredible Hulk, the original 70s or was it 80s TV series. Mm -hmm. He was also the, uh, I'm not going to say arch rival, it's not the right word, but arch competitor to Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the, yeah. the, 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 um, the bodybuilding days back in California on, on, um, in Gold's Gym and all this kind of legendary bodybuilding history. And there's a famous clip in um, Pumping Iron, which was Arnold Schwarzenegger's classic documentary, where he goes up to Louis and and he's just intimidating him because what Arnold did a lot was just intimidate people. Not, 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 not in a, like a sick way or anything, just like he'd go up to them before competition and go, ah, oh, Lou, so Louis, you're not, your muscles not looking so big at the moment. <laughs> yeah, all right. I didn't profess <laughs> to do impressions, guys. Come on, you've got a podcast. <laughs> like, just, just, what more do you want? <laughs> that was quite, quite good. It's quite good. Louis Faringo, your muscles aren't <laughs> as big as they should be. <laughs> Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> I'm getting worse, James, aren't I? <laughs> Funny thing is, I was showing my son, who's 10, some um, incredible Hulk clips a couple of weeks ago. And he thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. Did you compare it, you know, the the old 70s one to the Marvel ones now? You, you look at it, you think, well, how could we find that interesting? It's like the effects were shocking, really, weren't they? When you get yes. back to that. But, but this, was so, this was so good. In, 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 in the 70s and 80s, you just... The fact that we, I can't remember, was it David Banner 
he's this tormented man. He's the he's the, the wrong side of a scientific experiment, and every time he gets angry, he <laughs> goes green and big. Right? I think everyone, everybody. I don't need to explain that narrative, right? Even young people, even my five year old knows the Incredible Hulk story, right? But that bit where he's changing the car wheel and he slips and he grazes his knuckle or whatever and then suddenly you see the eyes. <laughs> I think we all feel a bit like that sometimes. <laughs> and he's going to turn. He's going to turn. It's, he's, when, when, when my son has a whoopsie, right? Not a whoopsie, that sounds like like he's peed on the carpet or something. No, what I meant is, you know, when he ha when he has a moment, like, <laughs> I, I look at my girlfriend and I'm like, Jen, he's hulking out. He's hulking <laughs> out. He's hulking out. He's don't. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great strategy to shut him up, actually. <laughs> so basically. You know, that, that shoot was funny because he had this massive um, bronze Hulk bust in his gym and I said oh can you get a shot if you're holding that and he kind of reached up and plucked it off this really high shelf and he goes do you mind holding it for a second while I just he goes and moves some weights out of the way and he gave me this massive bronze bust with one hand and it's like oh. <laughs> he must have weighed about 25 kilos just handed it over it was, uh, yeah, yeah strength on a different level it um, is yeah I just queued up a, a portrait there and I'm, I'm just going to go back to it because we were talking about Louis while I was looking at, um, oh yes, this gentleman, Ron Jeremy. Yes. My gosh. <laughs> really? Shut that me. wasn't, we didn't plan that shoot. We just bumped into him. We were covering a, um, have you ever heard, do you know what a juggalo is? A what, sorry? A juggalo. It's a kind of subculture in America. Where these I, people dress up as clowns. Oh right, no, I I don't think so. I I thought I had, but but maybe not. But you you were started off by a band called the Insane Clown Posse back in the nineties. It grew into this massive subculture, and um, they have a festival every year in I think it's in Kentucky or somewhere like that. And we went to it. We just bumped into Ron Jeremy there. We said, "Can we just do a quick interview?" Um, and he just sat there. I think he was pushing his new, um, he had a bottle of rum out called Rum, rum Jeremy. And he was flogging that. <laughs> so, but he's, he's kind of personal on grata now, isn't he? He's been in trouble for all sorts of weirdness over the last year. He well, let's just to... expl explain to, to our younger audience, so like, who the hell is this guy? Um, he, he was a massive porn star in the 70s. He was, yeah. kind, of, he was kind of like... Um, instrumental in in the in the original let's call it the the upsurge of of pornography and this was a guy when whenever you made a reference to porn in the 80s you used to add you used to tag ron jeremy's name into it so it's like yeah he's he's hung like ron jeremy and it was famous <laughs> that, that ron jeremy had a big big 12 inch dick or something but he's um, such an unattractive man, isn't he? He's like he's the hedgehog, they used to call him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think back in the day, no disrespect, Ron, if you ever get to, to watch this, but I think you were a bit more of a handsome Stalin than you, than, than you possibly are now. It's, <laughs> hey, come on, say la vie, it's, it's the same for all of us. But <laughs> I think back then you you... You know, you didn't necessarily have to be like massively good looking to be a porn star. You just had to be like a bit big and buff and, and um, you know, have the gear down, down below. <laughs> never, right never, equipment. <laughs> never thought I'd be having this conversation. <laughs> well, that, that, that shoot, I mean, I think I shot about 10 frames in the back of a trailer at a backstage at a festival. It was just, um, oh, I'm Jeremy. I'm going to see him again in my life probably, so. There we go. Did he give you any tips? Uh, tips on your love, <laughs> on your love life? Well, weirdly, the writer who I was with had met him a few times, so they were just chatting away because you know it's like weird little circles you move in sometimes. Oh, done it again. I double clicked. Sorry. What about this gentleman, Simon Pegg? Oh, oh yeah. I forgot I did that shoot, and then somebody reminded me about 
five five or six months ago. It's when you know that show Spaced. Do you remember that comedy show? Quite oh, off the wall. I, it, this was after I stopped. If it was been in the last twenty years, I I haven't watched mainstream at all. Oh, it might even have been the nineties, but around two thousand ish. It's when comedy was still a bit avant garde. You know, it's just, it wasn't being censored. It could people. You could say you could have stereotypes. You could say certain things. It's a good show space. And I shot the whole cast. It was him and um, I forget some other well-known actors or comedic or pack. They are. They've been in shows like Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead and all those kind of things. But yeah, he yeah. Right I saw. Idea. I saw a. The, is it this one? There's a group. There's a group photo of him and um, and his co-stars. What? What was? What's his? He's going to hate me for saying this, but I'm going to use the term sidekick. Um, I've got no names now. What do they call? I know the guy. He's in Hot Fuzz, isn't he? Yes, yeah, and 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 he's a legendary. Act. He's he's bloody brilliant. I'm just cool. Uh, apologies if you ever get to watch this. It's just I I've got no memory. I I party for was it thirty years every day. <laughs> now now I've just got enough memory to run a podcast, and that's about it. But. Um, Oh, my girlfriend would... Um... Nick Frost. Yes, Nick. Sorry, Nick. My gosh. There we are. I was just, just going to the search engine and you've rescued me. <laughs> Nick Frost, yeah. Abs absolutely brilliant actor. Um, obviously he is because he's made all the, 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 the series, isn't he? And and the what was our, what was the vampire one? The Oh, Shaun of the Dead. Shaun he was of the in the Dead. Yes. Oh, they're all in them, though. No, it's zombie, a, 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 zombie. What am I talking about? Vampire zombie. Sorry. Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, and Jessica Hines is the girl, and she's in all those films as well. Not all of them, but she pops up in quite a few of these projects. And Mark Heap, quite an old gaggle of sort of friends that stick together. But, so yeah. Yes. Um, hang on, I'm just going to go back. So Simon Pegg, yes. Um, did he try and borrow any money off you? <laughs> no. Why'd you ask? Uh, I just got I got an email from him the other day, and he he was just he wanted to borrow a tenner, and I just had to say, Simon, listen, mate, come on. Just because I'm uh, I'm in the limelight now, I'm not. I'm. You're gonna have to. You either get a control of your finances, Simon, or just just ask somebody else. Really, when we did do that shoot, I think it was before we got really big, to be honest, because it was in a tiny little flat up in um, oh, something like it was up in North Islington. It wasn't a big place; it was his place. So it's kind of funny when you see them and they're living normal lives. He's hit the Hollywood big time now, hasn't he? Yes, he's done incredibly well. He's done Britain proud as an actor, um, and so is this gentleman, isn't he, Ronnie? Ronnie O'Sullivan, look at that! What a shot! Oh yeah, yeah, like Ronnie too. How was Ronnie? Yeah, somebody who speaks his mind as well, isn't he? Yeah, well, he's down to earth, isn't he? He's a no nonsense mm. guy. He's seen a lot of, um, excuse my French, but shit in his life. You know, his, his dad's been been banged up, hasn't he? And 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 he's he's just come come out of it. Fight. He's never let himself down. He's never yeah. he's never been rude or offensive, um, other than what we all are, because we you know we all we all have a, a moment every now and again. And as a snooker player, I mean, it, is he not the best in the in the world that we've ever known? I've got to be honest, Chris. I don't follow snooker that much. Um, but yeah, just I, I... just just say yes, then, James. <laughs> yeah, but you know it's a funny world, isn't it, snooker? Because it seems so so. It's quite a civilized sport when you see it on TV. But yeah, when you hang around snooker halls, they're quite seedy places, aren't they? Sometimes quite um. Well, it's weirdness going on in them. It's the hours these guys have to put into practice, isn't it? It's not. If you could just rock up and play a tournament and win it and go home and you know drink a bottle of champagne, brilliant. <clears throat> But actually, what you don't see behind here is 12 hours of practice yeah, every -stop. single yeah. day of their lives, you know. It's amazing. They just hang out in those snooker halls all day, every day. It's mad. You know, I, did, I, just, I did a shoot years ago in Vegas on a pool hustler. So 
we were hanging around in these pool halls. And again, it's the same thing, like these bizarre characters you'd see coming and going in the corner, just there all night. Because they're 24 hour, these places. They don't, they don't close. Yes. But yes. Home, like home, that. I'm guessing they become home from home. So um, to friends at home, don't hate me because I'm scrolling past your favourite celebrity and like, Chris, why don't you talk about this guy? Like Bradley Wiggins I saw there. I mean, my God, that guy's got a story. But what about, yeah. this, what about this chap, Chris Evans? Again, Chris Evans. I've shot him. Is it, is it the picture of him with the um, tea sticking out of his mouth? Yeah, it looked... Uh, I, I'll be honest, I thought it was a, a roly, but now you've said that it's a golf tee, I can see what it is. Yeah, it was. it's supposed to be a bit of a copy of a Michael Caine portrait shot by David Bailey. I don't oh, know yeah. if you remember, there's a famous shot of Michael Caine. We thought we'd do it with um, Chris Evans because of the glasses. He looks... Is he wearing glasses in that picture? I can't yes. see. I can't see. Yes, can see. he is. Uh, yeah. but, um, we shot that, and it was back in his drinking days. We went to the pub after for a pint. It's funny, he just didn't want us to leave. He, just wanted, he wanted us to be, I had to drive back to Bath, I think it was somewhere in Berkshire. Um, yeah, he, we could have stayed there all day and all night if we wanted to, just getting hammered with Chris Evans. But it wasn't to be. <laughs> yeah, Chris has had an interesting career. I mean, he's... He was, like, massively, massively popular, wasn't he? Early 90s with his late night show or his early evening show what, what, what was it called again don't forget what there was big a, breakfast wasn't that yeah the big breakfast and it was don't forget your don't toothbrush forget your toothbrush. then it was the i'm not sure if it's one of the same ones but where they used to drill a hole into the each guest got given a drill and they had to drill a hole into the desk so this desk as the series went on friends if you know which one we're talking about put it in the comments right um but then, of course, he went out of favour, didn't he? Massively, and you just didn't hear from him. We started hanging out with um, Gazza, didn't he? He went through a phase of drinking with Gazza and Jimmy Five Bellies. Remember that character? Yeah, Gazza, Jimmy Five Bellies, and the um, the other chap. Um, it became a bit of a kind of drinking gang. Yeah. I think that's when his career tailed off a little bit. He went to Virgin Radio, I think, I seem to remember after that. Yeah, went to Virgin, and then... I'm just going to say this. I, I feel for people that like end up their careers at the BBC because it just means you're a company man and, 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 and mm. ugh, ugh, you got to put out narratives like the, the one that we're seeing at the moment. And that, that's nothing to be proud. You know, again, it's just this doing it to, to stay in the limelight and to get the kudos. And it, it's, ah, ah, I spoke, I spoke to a BBC journalist the other day and he went, Chris, why are you always hammering us? I said, because I love my freaking son and he comes before you guys do with your lying, bloody, cheating, sculpt. <laughs> do you know the weird thing is, though? My two kids, they're 14 and 10. They don't watch any TV, any. Brilliant. It's all YouTube. They watch their favourite YouTubers. Or... So I do wonder what the future is of these big networks. If, if kids aren't watching it now, I mean, does that mean that there's, when they grow up, the viewership's just going to be gone? I, it's just they're just not interested in watching the BBC or ITV or Channel Four. Or you know, so it's, it's a tricky future ahead for these these big broadcasters. Yes, YouTube just comes with its own set of um, uh, questions for a parent and problems and things that you've got to negotiate. You know, my my son, mm. my son. Um, you know, my son watches a lot of YouTube. He's he's very young. But we're kind of like my my th the best part of my childhood was when I got to about 14 and I moved in with my dad. Right. And there were no rules. I could go when I want, come back when I want. I was always if you went out with your mates, even on a school night, I'll be the last one home. And I tell you what. It wasn't just brilliant, especially that I'd come from living with my mum and a, and a stepfather that was a bit of a mentalist. So it was it was like freedom for me. But even at that young age, I just loved that freedom. I loved just 
and by freedom, like my dad was treating me like an adult mm. and, and there were no like, you know, there were no like phony restrictions on me that just didn't really make sense that just, well, my parents said, I've got to make you be in bed by 10 o'clock. So I'm going to do that too. There was none of that. And, um, so with our son, we've tried to take a, a the line of, like, I want him to be educated, you know, I want him to to kind of, you know, find his way around a tablet, because this is the life that they're going to live, right? I don't, yeah. want, I don't want him to be a technical biff. He's like, Dad, how do I mm. blooming, how do I, how do I get into settings? It's, you know, I want him to be teaching me that stuff, right? Um, yeah. Because I don't want him to struggle in life. I want him to get out and, and have stuff like, yeah, yeah, it's just easy. You just do it like this, right? Yeah, you want to scroll through this, blah, 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 blah. blah. But of course, off the back of giving someone a tablet early, they get the children's YouTube, and it's it's not always good. In fact, he likes to watch YouTube on our big telly because I think he gets more of an adult content. And by that, I mean these American teenagers that are just all multimillionaires now because they Correct, yeah they it's made amazing, it. Isn't it? yeah. But I do sit him down and explain to him that I say, son, you know, these kids, they're, they're very, they live a very, um, uh, what's the word, you know, not spoiled lifestyle, but they're very lucky, mm. you know, and what are they doing? They're, they're going into a shop, they're spending thousands of dollars on plastic crap, then they're taking it into the beautiful wilderness, smashing it all up. Right, because none of them have got any technical skills. They've they've never had, you know, their dad's never shown them how to use a saw and a hammer and an axe like 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 my generation were taught. Many of my generation were taught, and instead they go out and try and build these contraptions that are just utter shit, like masking tape and all, and all of that sun ends up in the ocean. All that plastic ends up in the ocean, killing the beautiful fish. And why? Just to make a, yeah, a thirty-minute YouTube video that that makes these guys millionaires and. Well, yeah. Not sure how we got into, not sure how we got into YouTube from your wonderful <laughs> photography, but um. Okay, let's go to these guys. Oh. Uh, what have we got here? Is it Rod Stewart? Is that Ronnie Wood? Ronnie Wood and um. Oh, what's he called? Kenny Jones. Kenny Jones, of course, yes. So the faces that did a get together last summer. Last summer? Bloody hell! Yeah, last year doesn't even count anymore, does it? Two thousand and nineteen. Because <laughs> I've just written last year off. Um, yeah, it was two thousand and nineteen. Did a get together gig, sort of come back, a charity thing. So I was lucky enough to go and shoot their portrait after the uh, after the concert. I mean, they're the three remaining members of that band. Again, I. I don't know how many people watching this know who the faces are. I don't know what your, your age demographic is, but they were a pretty big deal in that time. Oh, oh, huge. Um, yes. I mean, they're before our time, probably, but kind of Rolling Stones before them, really, weren't they? But, yeah. The faces, my God. Was, was, it the, oh, sorry. was it the small faces they were called, or was it the faces? I can't well, remember. Well, the faces, and I think they became the small faces, didn't they? They were, like a, they were like a mod, a mod band, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. These bands sort of changed their names over the years, like Jefferson Airplane and Jefferson Starship, and da, da, da. but yeah, they they morphed around a little bit. James, listen, I I could look at your photos forever. I think I think let's see what our audience response is to this 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 video because I bet a lot of them are like, why don't you ask about about, <laughs> about celebrity, Chris? Um, but no, I, I, it would be rude not to finish off with talking about your story. Um, and I think what it would be great to ask you is how, how did you get into all this? Um, and also, how has the technology gone? Because I think I mentioned <clears throat> to you earlier, like this thing here, my blooming Samson, can record 4K video. You can take images that are just out of this world and, and then edit them on the phone to make them look even more out of this world and um, yeah it's an interesting landscape isn't it well it's amazing when you think about your smartphone 
and when I was working down on the south coast doing um, sports, we could be kind of, well, I say, I won't, I won't take credit for it, but I ended up using it. One of the photographers I work with, Simon, created this thing. It was like a sort of um, tank with a kettle element shoved in the bottom. So it heats up the developer, the chemicals. So when you shot film, you could rush back to your car, kind of get a big bag out, put your hands in this bag, it's all kind of sealed. You could put, load your film up into these spools. You could develop it in these things in the boot of your car. And this was kind of kind of groundbreaking stuff. And then within 25 minutes, you could have the film developed, fixed and dried. And then you could rush back into the sports, to the ground, the stadium. And you could scan it through this big scanner that attached to your Mac. So within an hour, in theory, after the match, you could get all the pictures developed and wired off to the picture desks. And then you think, man, what are you doing? You're taking a picture and going, Shh, share, it's gone. And it's better quality. It's amazing, isn't it? And I'm only talking 25 years ago we were doing this. You know, maybe, maybe 26, but yeah. It's I mean, unthinkable technology we have now. That, How well, times have, have, have changed. Yes, it amazes me how we ever managed to capture an image in the old days when you had the old, the little camera that you went, Ch -ch. yeah, I and know. You, you, it, when you sent the film off to be developed, they 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 send you a free film with in the <laughs> return envelope, and you had what either twenty four or thirty six shots, depending on which which film you bought. Twelve sometimes as well. 12 yeah and you, and you had to you 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 had to get it right so you know i went on a I, well i've traveled a lot but i've been in new york as a as a 19 year old first sort of big holiday having dinner on windows on the world on top of the world trade center and seeing rockefeller plaza and and the big the big famous um the big famous toy shop and all, all the things to do in new york and yeah, when I look at those pictures now, I'm just so glad I got what I got. Mm, but yeah. I know that if I was to do that trip again, every photo wouldn't just be one, right, yeah, that's good. It would be, <laughs> oh, hang on, no, no, let's do that again, right. Hang on, oh, oh, God, to cut, cut the guy's legs, so hang on, I'm going to back a bit, back a bit, right, that's, right, okay, yeah, that's, and you don't even delete them now, do you? You keep all of them and you, you, yeah. But it's funny you say about New York, when you were night, what year was that? Because New York was a dump in those days, wasn't it? If you look back to the sort of early 90s, or I don't know how old you are, Chris, but I, I first went to New York for some mates on holiday in 1993, we went for two weeks. Yeah, I, Just, think, it, I think I was I there said, in, in not, I was there in 90 or 91, I think it was. Yeah, people will say, well, why are you going to New York? Because it, it was a bit of a byword for a, it was a oh, dangerous city, wasn't it, in those days? You, know, you wouldn't cross the bridge into Brooklyn without looking over your shoulder every few minutes. Whereas now you cross the Brooklyn Bridge and it's, it's like hipsterville, isn't it? It's, it's, but um, those cameras, again, it's little, those little um, 120, um, what are they called? The little 12, for, for, what they're called, the tiny ones. Bear in mind, they were revolutionary at the time because until then, people used to have things like sort of stuff like this around in the 1950s. Yes. You know, and you just have to sit there and you focus it on the side and set your aperture and everything. And so the, those um, little instamatic cameras were kind of made it easy in a way. It's funny how it changes so quickly. If you look at the exponential rise, are we going to be in 20 years' time? You know, are we going to have cameras in our eyes or because we're just going to have a visor on all the time, just taking pictures and recording everything? It's, it's getting to the point of being quite freaky, really, isn't it? How much we're recording. Do you ever get to the situation, James, where you've taken, you know, let's just say, I don't know how many you take. I mean, maybe a hundred snaps of your subject. Have I, am I supposed to say snaps? Is that, is, is That's it That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Craft, finely crafted photographs. Okay. So you've taken like a hundred shots and is it ever like, ah, oh, damn, I just didn't get the one. I just didn't get that one. Can happen. Can happen, yeah. But then sometimes you. So it wasn't that long ago. I was shooting on medium format cameras where you have ten frames to a roll, and if you only have three backs, the back is where you had a pre-loaded roll of film. 
really, if you only have 10 minutes and you only have three backs, you only shoot 30 frames and that'd be a rush because it's quick, quick, you know, and it's, um, yeah, it's easy. Sometimes you can overshoot and by overshooting, you're not really getting into it. You know, you just flash, 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 flash. So it, it, it depends. Mm. It depends on the person you're shooting as well because sometimes they don't want to be there. You could shoot all day and you wouldn't get anything, <laughs> to be honest. And then you get someone who's happy to try and give you... Because you, you know how, like, in an interview, you said before the podcast, you said you want to get you want people to open up and give you something. Well, that's what a portrait's like, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. if someone just puts on their, their game face and just does this, what, what do you get? You know, all you can hope to get from that is a well-lit picture, whereas you want to try and coax something out of them. And that's, that's where it's hard. It really is. Is that's... Is it is it annoying that any Tom, Dick and Harry these days, you know, if they've got a smartphone, can, I wouldn't say take photographs, but I think you know what I mean. You know, they, 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 you can take a photo on that phone and then you can enter it in a competition. And, 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 and as you and I well know, there's like a massive amount more to photography than just go and click. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 but is that a sort of you know, um, you know? doesn't really clash with my world that really you know because lo lots of photography is right place right, right time isn't it so if you happen to be in the middle of a Berlin winter market Christmas market when a truck goes down it and you've got the video for, you've got the pictures that's the best camera in the world isn't it because it's the one that's taking pictures at the right time. Well, if you happen to be looking over the um, Somerset levels when the, you know, because you're up walking the dog when the clouds all low, uh, you're just there, aren't you? Right place, right time. Mm -hmm. But I don't really do that sort of work, so it's never really bothered me because most of my work's quite considered set up. You know, you go to a place at a certain time, you get 10 minutes for the person, or you get an hour, or you get, you know, you're covering an event like a festival or a, you know, you're hanging out with some cult members in some sort of religious compound somewhere. You know, it's, it's a different sort of thing, really. Are you are you allowed to say who's been the biggest, like, idiot that you've had to work with? Yeah. Uh, other dead. than, other than dead, me. So I can. <laughs> um, Bruce Forsyth. I can say it. Really? He's really horrible, yeah. Just a tricky guy. Hey, let's talk bad about the dead. Come on, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was just rude. I don't mind saying it now because he's not with us anymore. But, I mean, he wasn't very nice to me and he wasn't very nice to his wife either. And that's the, fun, the thing that annoyed me the most. Um, Do you think that's because he came from that generation where they're just their egos were just played to? They, you know, I don't know. I mean, he was a big name, wasn't he, for, for so many years. He, he, he never really knew what it's like to not to not be a celebrity. Yeah, and that, that must be a real danger when you achieve that level of fame. But um, if anyone's a foreign, like an American, really, he was a big TV star, wasn't he? A like proper Saturday night host of all the big game shows and talent shows and all, you name it. Um, yeah, he was just a bit of a prickly guy. I didn't, you know, unnecessarily rude to his wife and, and to me and the journalist too. Um, there are many. Most people are professional, I would say. I've come across some. Um, I've been doing more reportagey stuff. You come across some odd people. Doing, you doing know, what? Doing what? Um, doing the reportage. You know, when you're covering stories or covering, you come across. But then you deliberately seek them out because they're odd. So I don't. You go into it with the full knowledge that someone's going to be a bit tricky. Yeah. I know, mean, but, what about the voodoo stuff you've covered? That is just. That's another side of life. Oh, Santeria. Yeah. Yeah, can I just, just, just uh, sorry to interject again with the old, you know, what's going on in the world stuff, but, you know, if people think that all this symbolism stuff is, is like, there's no place for it, it's weird, it's just conspiracy, well, hang on, we, we got to remember there's people that practice voodoo in the world, it's yeah. the fastest growing religion is voodoo, black magic. Um, yeah, it, I was. I, we were told that the fastest growing religion in LA was Santeria, which yes. is a bit of a, which, you, like you say, it's, it's voodoo by another name, really, isn't it? It's 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 a kind of African religions crossed with a bit of Catholicism, 
came out of um, Cuba mostly, but with a West African influence, Dominican Republic around there. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's very odd. You don't, you know. So, um, what was the chap like that you photographed? It was a chap, wasn't it? The, the... Yeah, two guys. He ran a, I don't know what you call it. Like a, it's not, a, not called a church. It's not called a temple. I've forgotten the name there. But the funny thing was, it was very popular with celebrities, this religion. So lots of celebrities trying, and you buy your way in, you buy, you buy favours from the spirits, you buy ceremonies, you buy potions and they're supposed to do certain things. It's always, I mean, I don't believe in anything like that, but it's a funny thing that it seems to be um, popular amongst the Hollywood elite, the Santeria. Um, faith, whatever you want to call it. They're, so. they're all going to be into, you know, they're into their Kabbalah, aren't they? And their blooming masonry yeah. and... and well, yes. um, I'll tell you what, for anybody listening, freedom is just way more valuable. Just be yourself. Yeah. You don't need to buy into anybody else's potion. Just be yourself. It's such a... It's so rewarding to live... <laughs> And know that nobody's got a handle on you. You you don't belong to this church. You, you, I'm I'm not talking about you know people that that use the wonderful story of Jesus Christ as a, a sort of guideline in their life. You know I I, I probably well I, I certainly do too. But I just mean I'm not a member of any church, any cult, any any just the cult of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> But it's funny, though, when you look at it, if you break it down, we're all primates at the end of the day, aren't we? And we, we have pro, sort of semi-programmed behaviour that we form hierarchical structures, we form little tribal groups. And that's kind of what religions are in a way, isn't it? We're, we kind of find our place in these hierarchical structures. We look up to a leader to tell us what to think and what to do. So when you look at Santeria, it's all part of a feeling of belonging and a feeling of you, you're part of this tribe of tribe of Santeria. And it's the same for the Church of Scientology, isn't it? It's the same for all these things. It's people seeking out meaning, seeking out a, a sense of belonging. And then they we, we programmed to be hierarchical, aren't we? Everything's hierarchical, from a family structure up to a business, to a government, to a, a school, you name it. You, you look at any institution and it's hierarchical. So we do. And then, but if you're not of that mindset, it's quite tricky to live, isn't it? If you're not a, so if you can recognise these hierarchical structures and you don't want to be part of one, life doesn't really work for you that well. That's it's, it's a tricky. Very, um, um, surreptitious. I mean, I, it might surprise people to learn, but I've been involved in one, two, three. I've been involved in four, four cults now, right? People who immediately envision me with like dressed in a white sheet and chanting some devil stuff or something. No, no, no it, 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 if you want to use the, the 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 definition of what constitutes a cult, so I was brought I was brought up um you know in 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 the church right. Um, again, I mean no disrespect to anybody out there, but. They, they, they very much operate along along the principles of like you're either with us or or, 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 or or you're sort of not. That's just a very terrible analogy, folks. It's going to get me in trouble. I can see it. But but yeah, you know, I, the, the church. And then, of course, I was involved in the military, which again is a kind of, what? You're going to leave? Oh, don't leave, mate. No, don't. There's nothing out there for you. You, you just, you know, you know, it... it People listeners are going to go. What the military is a cult? This guy's an idiot. It's like no, dude. Like learn, learn what you know. Learn. Le I don't mean like it's. <laughs> ah, I don't even know what I mean. But there, there was that, and then um, I was involved in network marketing. Believe it or not, and network okay. marketing again very much has this influence, this cult-like influence in. Some more than others. Some not not all network marketing. Some are just genuine like opportunities, right? But I spent time with people from a company called Amway, and mm. oh my God, you've never met such indoctrination, 
such false hope sold to these 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 individuals right and then finally i actually was in um was in an organization in norway when i did my volunteer work so when i worked in mozambique and i i drove journalists to africa and back um the organization in in scandinavia was like a massive cult um they actually had not so much for those of us that were just volunteering but the core group within this organization that managed everything was literally run along the lines of a cult you know they had a co communal money um if if anybody ever broke the rules the rest of the the team would get around them and just be like right you've done this and you've done what have you got to say are you sorry are you so and like they would batter you until you went yeah yeah like i'm i'm, I'm sorry guys oh and uh, okay right now you, now you can come back it's always like like the life, life of brian or something it was um <laughs> but uh yes yeah, so um we are funny aren't we as human animals we're just so susceptible to these influences in our lives and i think you could you could stick 100 people strangers on a desert island and within a year, they'd form little groups, guarantee it. And as the hundred grew, the groups would grow, and they'd probably end up fighting. That's what yeah. would happen. And one one group would uh, be wearing their underpants on their face, and in, in, so they didn't infect others with this. Uh... <laughs> All right, let's not go there. But yes, what a crazy species we are! You know, we should just live and let live. Really... I, like, I like to stand back and look in because if you, if you take a really broad view on what's happening and what's happened in the past as a pattern, you can see, God, you know, we're not always right. Often the majority of people are very, very wrong and get things wrong all the time. And it's, the, it's I'm not saying, well, I don't know any names, but it's, often it's the brave soul who speaks up. Yeah. It is right. It might, he might not even be recognised for it, it getting acknowledgement. It might be the wave that comes after, you know, it's, it's that... Um, People don't like to put their head above the parapet, do they? That's the problem. No. Get shot at. <laughs> Get shot at. James, listen, this has been just one of the most fascinating chats I've had in my life. Um, absolutely <laughs> amazing, James. Thank you so much. Um, no, thank you. I I've got a feeling like we're going to chat again. Um, what... How can people hire your services or commission you? What? How does all this work? Um, my website, jamescheedle.com. Look below the video, folks. I'm going to put a link to James's website. Or if you're listening on iTunes, just um, you'll find James, I'm sure, in a, in a search engine. We did have a YouTube channel ourselves, but you know how you're saying how it's a tricky platform. We gave up on it. It just everything was getting taken down all the time. We were putting, did you look? I don't know. It's called Union Features, the um, Union Magazine, actually. And we would just shoot video of some of our stories, but because yes, I, quite, I, 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 I did. You quite esoteric. Some of it. Some of it's just basic reporting, but some of it. So we just gave up. It was just we put all this effort into doing these videos and traveling to the states or wherever we'd go. And then you get back and you put it up and it's just gone, taken down two days later. So, you, you know, but. Yes. Um, we did cover some pretty tricky subjects, mind you. <laughs> um, you know. This is the thing, you know, did any, does anything ever good come from censorship? It's, I, I'm going to oh. say, I, 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 you know, there's a difference between having rules, you know, people abusing other people. I mean, that's not good people hurting uh, children or animals, you know, that, that shouldn't be put up with. But people just having freedom of speech as as, yeah. as adults, um, it, when that starts getting censored, you you know you're, you're, you're living under totalitarianism and it's not going to be good. And some people, hint, hint, try to, like, w warn us about this. Um, I'm, I'm the same. I'm a, I'm a free speech absolutist. I don't mean anything that's in, insightful, but I think the best way to beat bad ideas is with good ideas. I don't think you beat bad ideas by by silencing the person saying it. I think you just no. You you're putting the problem away for a later date. That's all you do. Bad ideas don't go away by censorship. They, they need good ideas to, to to trump. That's what I think. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. 
So James, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly. Um, just want to put a big shout out uh, and dedicate this podcast to Ian Brown, just a living legend for for standing out, standing out, putting himself in the in the firing line, so to speak. But just an absolute uh, uh, legend, and I, I w- want to thank you personally. To our friends at home, um, could you please put in the comments? Which of the celebrities that we didn't look at would you have wanted us to talk about um, and why? And massive love to you all. Um, You're all legends. Thank you for supporting the podcast. And we'll see you next time. Guys, 